Hello, my name is Julie Fry and I'm the curator at Stan Hewitt Hall and Gardens. 2023 marks the 125th anniversary of the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. In recognition of this tremendous achievement, we are issuing a 10 part video series, one each month beginning in March and running through the rest of the year. The Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company was founded by F.A. and his brother C.W. Cyberling. F.A. and his wife Gertrude Cyberling are also responsible for the conception and creation of Stan Hewitt Hall and Gardens their family home for 40 years. In this month's episode, we're going to be talking about the construction of the first dirigible that Goodyear helped build, named the Akron. In 1911, F.A. was approached by an explorer and inventor named Melvin Vanneman with the proposal to underwrite the cost of building a dirigible that would become the first flying machine to cross the Atlantic. At that point, no other balloon or airplane had yet made a transatlantic journey and Vanneman was bound and determined to be the first. He had previously been part of a team of people headed by an explorer, Walter Wellman, with another dirigible named the America, which attempted to both fly to the North Pole and also complete a transatlantic crossing, both unfortunately unsuccessful. Wellman had retired from those adventures at that point, but Vanneman decided to kind of pick up where Wellman had left off and try to continue the adventure of being the first to cross the Atlantic Ocean. So in May of 1911, F.A. signed a contract with Melvin Vanneman to manufacture a dirigible balloon to chart a flight across the Atlantic Ocean. F.A. would furnish the capital and Vanneman would have control over the construction and engineering of this balloon. F.A. agreed to provide at that point $30,000. He would get to pick the fabric for the dirigible and also to name it. Of course, the incentive for F.A. was to have the dirigible manufactured at the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company at that time and to get Goodyear's name behind what could be a very uh, widely publicized and you know highly anticipated event. And if it was successful when it happened, then this could stir up a lot of revenue and business for Goodyear to get into that dirigible market. At that point, there were some European companies that were building dirigibles, the Germans being kind of the most notable at that time, but no company in America had really gotten behind this new technology and this idea of flight, especially going such long distances. So construction began at the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. They actually built the balloon material on the fifth floor of the factory. And there's a great quote here. F.A.'s son, Willard, was head of the aeronautics department at Goodyear at that time. And he says, the department's first order covered the construction of the gas bag for the largest semi-rigid dirigible yet built. The 400,000 cubic feet airship Akron with which Melvin Vanneman proposed to be the first to cross the Atlantic by air. We felt a thrill in starting off by building the largest gas bag ever constructed up to that time. For the next six months, our little department was the center of interest at Goodyear. An atmosphere of mystery seemed to surround our activities. Our visitors seemed more or less struck with awe when they entered the forbidden room. They watched the draftsmen working out the exact size and shape of every pattern, saw the long rolls of fabric cut into these various patterns, saw those different pieces of fabric cemented together, saw the balloon heaped in a wrinkled mass around the sewing machine. Some persons could not believe that it was possible to compute the exact curve for each pattern. Others marveled that all those patterns could be placed together without a gap or a heavy overlap occurring when the last two should meet. But when the huge envelope was inflated for the first time in Mr. Vanneman's hangar at Atlantic City, it filled out beautifully to the correct shape proving to be a very high grade piece of workmanship. Now the fabric at Goodyear was made of layers of cotton and rubber put together. So it was four layers of rubber and three layers of the finest cotton, but it was so thin that it was only 0.03 inches thick. The fabric was made then by coating on both sides with a rubber material which cemented all the pieces together. And it said it had a tensile strength of 175 pounds per inch. One of the striking features about the balloon was its color. It was actually a bright yellow color. And the idea behind that was that um, it would help deflect the rays of the sun because the heat of the sun was a concern when having a large hydrogen balloon up there in the air and they didn't want the gas to expand or cool too quickly based on the weather around them. So they thought that the yellow would help repel those ultraviolet rays and stabilize the gas inside the bag. 
So once the construction was finished at the Goodyear factory, it was actually boxed up. The box that was created to move it to Atlantic City where the testing would take place was six feet wide, six feet deep, and 30 feet long. Um, and when the bag was packed into the box, it weighed over 5,000 pounds. They actually had to remove the windows on the fifth floor of the factory building and bring that box out with a crane to load it onto a vehicle to drive it to the train station in Akron to then load it and take it out to Atlantic City. So once it arrived out in Atlantic City, um, this was the summer of 1911, Vanneman began to do test flights. So he had a crew of between five and six people. It sometimes varied. With each test flight, usually there would be some sort of a little incident. Something would happen. The landing would be a little awkward. And they'd have some difficulty steering the dirigible. But with each flight, the idea was they brought it back down to the hangar, made some improvements, figured out what needed to happen so that when they finally made that voyage across the Atlantic Ocean, it would go flawlessly. Everyone was extremely confident about the success. Both F.A. Cyberling and Melvin Vanneman were interviewed multiple times, boasting very confidently about how the Akron would be the first dirigible to cross the Atlantic Ocean. So it was actually on July 2nd, 1912, when Vanneman was taking the Akron out for its final test flight, that there was a catastrophe. And the dirigible left the hangar, went out, sailed around the ocean. A bunch of different people, of course, came out every time in Atlantic City to watch it. Vanneman's wife, as well as the wives of some of the other men on the dirigible were watching at the time. And then um, suddenly there was a noise that they said could be heard from the beaches and the balloon exploded and crashed into the ocean and all five men on board were killed. There was a big debate over the cause of the explosion. Some thought that gas was exhausted from the balloon. It was happening right over the propeller engines and possibly that created a fire, the combination of that hydrogen gas being exhausted. Others said it was because of the heat from the sun. It was suddenly, it had been a foggy day and then the fog broke and the sun came out, caused the gas to expand too quickly and it ruptured inside the gas bag of the balloon. So newspapers kind of reported both of those things and it's not really clear if there ever was the exact cause found out. Uh, this was a devastating event for not only the families of the men that were on the Akron, but also for the Cyberling family as well. They had become very, very close with the Vanemans. Um, Melvin and his wife, they'd gone to Cedar Lodge together. They'd come here to Akron and stayed at their home on East Market Street. So F.A. was very devastated, of course, also being the underwriter and the financier. He really did feel a lot of personal responsibility for it. He paid for the funerals of all of the individuals and also started a fund, a widow's fund, so that each of the families would have some semblance of financial support since their husbands and fathers had all passed away. He said in a quote that he lost his taste a little bit for air travel after that, kind of the excitement and the anticipation of what it was. Goodyear really backed away for a couple of years from thinking of dirigibles again, but as they kind of got further away from the accident of the Akron, they decided to try again and you know see if they could improve upon the process and, and make dirigible travel safer. And a final note, the lifeboat that was part of the Akron dirigible was salvaged from the wreck and taken back to Akron and stored at the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. And it remained there until 2010 when the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum reached out to Goodyear to see if they would be willing to donate it to the museum to be preserved as part of aeronautic history. So Goodyear did make that donation and it is now part of the collection of the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. And at least at one point was on display, I'm not sure if it is today, but there is a piece of Akron history out in Washington, DC. So thank you once again for joining me to learn more about Goodyear history. I look forward to sharing more again with you next month.